One of the biggest jobs I have to tell you that the right wing news media has is remembering, is keeping memory alive, because what you're going to see now, what you're seeing already uh, is what I call the great forgetting. You know, suddenly, all of a sudden, like that, we're going to forget everything that the left has been doing for these last four years as if they have behaved like just angelic, you know, emanations of constitutional governance. Here, just to give you a sample, is Whoopi Goldberg telling us how and who, who, who of us, who of us among us doesn't turn to Whoopi Goldberg to find out how sh- we should behave. But here's Whoopi Goldberg telling conservatives how they should behave as cut 11. When you know who was elected four years ago, you know, Hillary Clinton didn't say, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't feel right. Stop the count. She didn't say this isn't right. I'm not going for it. she didn't say any of that. So all of you suck it up, suck it up like we sucked it up. And if you are not sure that you are comfortable with Joe Biden, do what we did. Find things and then take it to the law. And if the law says it's something to look at, look at it. But from now on, suck it up. <laughs> We're going to get to Hillary Clinton and what she said in just a minute. But first, let's remember all the other stuff, the Russian collusion stuff and the Ukraine impeachment. You know, did anybody mention this during the debates, the coll- Russian collusion or Ukraine impeachment? Anybody mention that Brett Kavanaugh is a serial rapist who's probably still running around, going on ships and uh, lining up at doors at the gangbang uh, clubs that he was uh, attending in their imaginations? I remember Stormy Daniels and Michael Avenatti, who was going to be president of the United States. Remember all that stuff? Not Whoopi. She doesn't. But we are not going to forget. We're not going to forget. And we're not going to move forward uh, in within ignorance of what they did. OK, but but this is another important point about what I want to talk about. We are going to move forward. We are going to move forward. Obviously, fight the fight, fight the fight in the courts. Maybe you can overturn the election. Like I said yesterday, it's going to be a hard climb, but maybe you can do it. Fight the fight. But we're going to have to move forward. And this is the thing. It's hard to remember without becoming bitter. It's hard to remember without being perennially angry. And that is something like I'm not willing to do. I'm not going to live my life, even under a Joe Biden uh, presidency, constantly bitter, constantly uh, annoyed at the lies being spewed by The New York Times, a former newspaper uh, or NBC or CBS or ABC. We get it now. We get it. They lie. They're corrupt. They're the representatives of corporations. They have nothing to do with the people. They have nothing to do with the Constitution. They don't like the Constitution. All their talk about protecting our democracy from Trump, all of it lies, 100 percent lies. But if we build venues where we can speak, then we can live in the truth. And we're not going to spend four years of the Biden administration, uh, you know, miserable, because if we do that, they'll have won a true victory, a victory far greater uh, than than just an election. So. Let's let us go back. Let us a little bit of a walk down memory lane. I'll start by reading uh, the great McGurn, Bill McGurn in The Wall Street Journal. He's talking about Biden's call for unity. And by the way, I think Biden was right to have a call for unity. That's what the president has to say. I'll be president of all the people. He has to say those things. But that doesn't mean that we can just sit there and forget all the things that happened. And, and Bill McGurn in the journal says, if Mr. Biden means it, he will need to show it. He might start by stating that there's no place in his administration for anyone who joins in Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's call for a de facto blacklist of Trump supporters, which she did call for. And it's just amazing to me that this bartender who was put into Congress uh, went from a bar, attending bar to being in Congress, has become a a communist uh, thug. He goes on to say this might upset some of Mr. Biden's supporters, but that's leadership. It's essential, even if Mr. Trump and some of his supporters make it no easier by insisting after the litigation is exhausted and the results certified that Mr. Biden hasn't been legitimately elected. Wherever would Mr. Trump and his supporters get such an idea not to believe in an election? Maybe from those who spent the past four years undermining the legitimacy of the Trump presidency. And he then goes to Hillary Clinton. Now, remember what Whoopi Goldberg said? Hillary Clinton didn't go around saying I didn't win. This is Hillary Clinton. In 2019, three years, three years after she lost the election, cut nine, 
He knows he's an illegitimate president. He knows. He knows that there were a bunch of different reasons why the election turned out the way it did. And I take responsibility for those parts of it that I should. But, Jane, it was like applying for a job and getting 66 million letters of uh, recommendation and losing to a corrupt human tornado. And so I know that he knows that this wasn't on the level. I don't know that we'll ever know everything that happened, but clearly we know a lot and are learning more every day and history will probably sort it all out. So of course he's obsessed with me. (laughs) He's obsessed with her. Yeah, okay. You know, Bill McGurn goes on, says, Jimmy Carter, June 2019, three years. There's no doubt that the, this is Carter speaking, there's no doubt that the Russians did interfere in the election, and I think the interference, though not yet quantified, if fully investigated, would show that Trump didn't actually win the election. In 2016, he lost the election, and he was put into office because the Russians interfered on his behalf. Asked if that meant he regarded Mr. Trump as an illegitimate president, Mr. Carter said yes. In January 2017, Gerald Nadler said he was boycotting Mr. Trump's inauguration because the president wasn't legitimate. During impeachment, another effort to reject the 2016 election, Speaker Nancy Pelosi said the House had no choice but to act because Mr. Trump was trying to corrupt once again the election for his benefit, not to mention the ridiculous attempt to paint a candidate who attracted more minority votes than any Republican in recent history as a champion of white supremacy. And finally, Mr. Biden piled on with the rest of them when he was asked if uh, when he was asked by a voter if Trump was an illegitimate president. He said I, some a voter said to him, Trump was an illegitimate president. In my mind, Biden's response was, I absolutely agree. All right. So this suck it up stuff, you can suck that up yourself, you know, because this is it's unbelievable that we are now supposed to go through the great forgetting of all the stuff that we went through. And, you know, and and maybe we should just make Michael Avenatti. Is he in prison still? I can't remember whether he's still in prison. Let him out and let him be president. One more, just one more thing to read to you. Jared Baker, another excellent columnist of The Wall Street Journal, wrote this. If there's a single image that captures the hollow hypocrisy of these pleas for unity and healing. It was one I witnessed on the streets of Manhattan on Saturday in the minutes after the television networks had anointed Mr. Biden president-elect. Jubilant crowds dancing joyfully in front of stores that had been boarded up in advance of the election in case the result went the other way. It was a neat little tableau of the protection racket ethos that has defined American politics for the last four years. Vote for us so we can dance and celebrate. Vote against us and we'll burn down your business and steal your property. We do not forget this. We're not going to forget it. And again, I'm not going to live in bitterness. I'm not going to live in hate. I know who the press is. I know the press are now completely incredible. They no longer have any credibility whatsoever. So I'm not going to I'm not going to sit and clutch my heart about it all the time. But I am going to remember. Let's take Ben Rhodes. Now, here's Ben Rhodes, right? This is the guy who said that we sold that they sold Obama's Iran deal. He was Iran uh, Obama's aide. And he said we sold the Iran deal on the ignorance of reporters. He said all these newspapers used to have far Foreign bureaus, now they don't. They call us to explain to them what's happening in Moscow and Cairo. They literally know nothing. He laughed about this, and the press laughed with him. Boy, you pulled one over on us. And now Ben Rhodes is on television explaining to Nicole Wallace, a woman he obviously thinks is just as ignorant as the rest of the press, what they've been doing to get what they're doing, what Biden is doing to get the transition going. This is cut 20. The center of political gravity in this country and the world is shifting to Joe Biden. Foreign leaders are already having phone calls with Joe Biden talking about the agenda they're going to pursue January 20th. If that reality hasn't sunk in yet for some people in the White House, it will sink in when they have to leave on January 20th. They're having phone calls with foreign leaders. Now, we all remember that Michael Flynn, remember, when President-elect Trump was coming into office, General Michael Flynn, who was going to be his national security advisor, had a phone call with the Russian ambassador, Sergei Kislyak, right? And we remember what happened to him. That was a violation of the Logan Act. Remember the Logan Act? The Logan Act is what it, the Logan Act is this John Adams, I think it goes back to. It's it's never been used to prosecute anyone. It's almost certainly unconstitutional. It's been ignored through most of this. But suddenly the FBI, knowing Michael Flynn didn't lie, was at his door and was accusing him of lying about it uh, because Flynn got some of his 
facts wrong about the thing he's talking. He's been fighting not to go to prison because they he confessed to lying to the FBI because they threatened uh, to prosecute his son. Dianne Feinstein was saying that this proved that that Trump should be investigated. This is right. Trump hasn't even taken office. He's just taken office at this point. This is Dianne Feinstein explaining to Chuck Todd that Michael Flynn's conversation with Sergei Kislyak implicates Donald Trump in this in what should be investigated. Cut 21. I do not believe that General Flynn was a rogue agent. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that on his own um, conclusion he would go out and try to tell the Russians in two instances. Once uh, to uh, stop a national security resolution going through the United Nations regarding Israel and on the sanctions that President Obama had just put in, urged that they not be tampered with by the Transition Committee, and that he would go in on his own and attempt to tamper with them, uh, with Russia. I just don't believe that. I think he had to have been directed. Now, whether uh, the special counsel can find that evidence or not, whether we can, I don't know yet. But I see that that's where this is going. So Michael Flynn makes a phone call to the Russian ambassador, Diane Feinstein, who I think was head of the judiciary, judiciary. They're launching an investigation. Chuck Todd is, is the president under investigation, Senator Feinstein. This is at the beginning of the Trump administration. And now these clowns, these bozos, these lowlifes, this trash is going to tell us. I mean, that, of course, is the network that buried the Harvey Weinstein story. So we know who they are. We know who they all are. Now they're going to tell us, oh, you know, suck it up. Buttercup, suck it up like we did. We sucked. You didn't hear anything from Hillary Clinton. Suck it up. We do not forget. That is not the way this is going to go. And we now have a media that can respond. And we now have a media that can remember. And again, you know, well, let's let's hear from apex predator cocaine Mitch McConnell, who said this on the Senate floor yesterday. Cut seven. Let's not have any lectures, no lectures about how the president should immediately cheerfully accept preliminary election results from the same characters who just spent four years refusing to accept the validity of the last election, and who insinuated that this one would be illegitimate too, if they lost again, only if they lost. So let's have no lectures on this subject from that contingent. In late August, Secretary Hillary Clinton said, quote, Joe Biden should not concede under any circumstances when Speaker Pelosi was shopping some conspiracy theory about the Postal Service, she recklessly said, quote, listen to this, I have no doubt that the president will lie, cheat, and steal to win the election. Now, does this sound like a chorus that has any credibility whatsoever to say a few legal challenges from President Trump represents some kind of crisis? <laughs> <laughs> that's telling him, Mitch, he should. And, and that's exactly what all of us should be saying right now. So here's a true story. Something really happened to me a long, long time ago. I was with my son, Spencer, no relation. He was a little tiny kid. We were in a movie theater. Uh, we went to the men's room. And while we were in the men's room, he started playing with the... Uh, the hand dryer, you know, the blower, because he was so small, he was underneath the blower and he was kidding around, looked up, smacked into it with his head, split his skull wide open. One of the scariest moments of my life took him to the hospital and they're looking at him, examining him, and they're asking me questions. And suddenly I start to realize they're asking me questions about whether I did this, about whether I was being violent with my kid, which of course I would never be. It's a scary, scary moment. You know, Apex predator Cocaine Mitch has emerged from this administration as a hero. And I want to make a, a point for conservatives about how conservatives should behave when we're being lied to like this. And then we're told to forget all the lies. We're told to forget the four years of impeachment of, you know, Russian collusion of Stormy Daniels, of uh, Brett Kavanaugh's a rapist, all that stuff. We're just supposed to say that that never happened. You guys have been absolute. You guys, you guys have been like Lincoln on the dollar bill, you know, on the five dollar bill. You guys have been like the picture of constitutional uh, prudence and, you know, statesman like behavior. And we it's it is we, we who in questioning your crazy cheating and your lousy rules and your sudden rule changes uh, and the, your use of the uh, pandemic to have people voting in all kinds of crazy ways, we, we questioning that, we're the bad guys. 
not not happening. But but when I say we we shouldn't become bitter and we shouldn't become angry over this, but we should just move forward in the truth. There's some other stuff we should remember because a lot of us and, you know, we're frustrated with Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell has emerged from this as a hero. You know, the hero shot in the movie where the the guy comes striding out of the the cloud of smoke uh, and he emerges, uh, you know, victorious. That's (laughs) it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe that a guy like Mitch McConnell is that guy. But he is that guy. And one of the things he did, one of the things he did was preserve the filibuster. When a lot of us were saying he shouldn't have done that, and he had the respect for the institutions saying basically what one party can do, the other party can do. And since one party removed the filibuster for judges, every judge but the Supreme Court, it was all right to to remove the filibuster for the Supreme Court. That was following in their footsteps and letting them know that he was going to retaliate. But we should also remember there are people on the other side, there are moderates on the other side who will defend the institutions as we fear they might go, uh, as we fear they might be destroyed by the left if, for instance, we lose in Georgia and we lose the Senate majority, which would be terrible. It would be terrible for Biden. It would be terrible for the country. Hopefully the people in Georgia are going to get smart and show up and not going to stay at home and not going to shrug it off. And they're going to show up for the runoffs because here is um, is Joe Manchin from West Virginia famously moderate uh, senator because he's in a kind of right wing state. So he has to kind of play both sides. Here he is talking to Brett Baer about the fact that even if even if the Democrats take the majority in the Senate, he and others will not necessarily follow the radical agenda. This is cut five. When they talk about whether it be packing the courts or ending the filibuster, I will not vote to do that. I will not vote to pack the courts, I think, and I will not vote to end the filibuster. Brett, this system, the Senate was so unique body in the world. It was made to work together in a bipartisan way. And once you start breaking down those barriers, then you lose every every reason that we are the institution that we are, the most deliberate body. So I want to ra- lay those fears to rest, that that won't happen because I will not be the 50th Democrat voting to end that uh, filibuster or to basically uh, uh, stack the court. And then all the other things you're hearing about, Brett, also is defund the police. I don't know of any of the Democrats in the caucus that are for defunding the police. We're not for that whatsoever. And when they talk about basically uh, Medicare for all, we can't even pay for Medicare for some. Doesn't make any sense at all. We've got to fix the Affordable Care Act we have, and I think our Republican, moderate Republicans, will work with us to now repair what needs to be repaired. You know, when you talk like that, you have to remember there are still people in the Senate who are thinking that way. Mitch McConnell is often one of them. He did what he could do when when he saw the opening that Trump made for him in the line, in the defensive line. He went through that opening with all those judges, appoint, judge appointments. But but he maintained some of the integrity of the institution. We have to hope that guys like Joe Manchin will. Because, by the way, the guy running in Georgia in the runoff, Raphael uh, Warnock, he was asked if he would pack the court. And here's his response is cut two. If Democrats take majority, there would be court packing um, on the Supreme Court or the federal benches, as well as statehood approved for D.C. and Puerto Rico. So I wanted to ask what what your stance is on those, you know, three kind of issues. I, I think that they're trying to divide us again. And it's really sad because uh, at the end of the day, um, e pluribus unum, out of many one. That's the covenant we have with one another as an American people. I support that. I believe in it with all my heart, and I'm going to stand up and defend it. But do you, do you think that the you know with Amy Coney Barrett now on the Supreme Court, would you want to see the court expanded? I'm really focused on representing the concerns of ordinary people here in Georgia. <laughs> so, yeah, he packed that court like that, but he's just he's not he's just not answering that question at all. So you know where exactly where he stands. And let's hope the people in Georgia do as well. I hope you enjoyed that clip from the Andrew Claven show. If you did, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you stay up to date on all our future content.